Test.
right, good morning. morning. Good to see you this morning. Glad you made it in mostly dry. That's good to see. Thank the Lord for a place to meet that is out of the weather. Not everybody has that around the world today, but we do, so we'll be thankful for it. Let's start by singing. Brother Ken, where are we going to go? Page 589, Inner Hymn Books. All right, page 589, he is able. And you know, some of these songs have not enough room, I guess, to get it all on the page. So the way this one's written, we go all the way through to the end, and then we sing the first two lines again. He is able, he is able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He healed the broken hearted and set the captive free. He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. He is able, he is able, I know he is able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. All right, just think about what we just sang. He is able. He's able to save our soul. Heaven is ours. So many things. And right now, all the folks that you talk to that are out in the world are just so upset, so frustrated. Can't wait for November to come. Of course, we can't either. But that's not the cure-all. We know that. We gotta put our faith in the Lord because He is able. One more time. He is able. He is able. I know He is able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He healed the broken. Parted and set the captive free. He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. He is able, he is able. I know he is able. I know my Lord is able to. Carry me through. All right. Brother Don, you want to open us in a word of prayer? Amen. All right, Pastor. All right. A couple of weeks ago, we watched a video in the Sunday School Hour of our an update from our missionary in Zimbabwe, the Cadenheads. And uh, tonight, we'll be reading their first prayer letter from the field. And it worked out that their first prayer letter from the field was exactly one year from their first uh, prayer letter announcing their deputation. So, Lord bless them, definitely. A lot of people spend several years on deputation, and by the year, by the end of year one, they're on the field. So that's a blessing, and there's some pretty exciting things in the in the uh, update there. So we'll be reading that tonight during the evening service for this morning, as we've been looking for a couple of weeks now at young people in the Bible and what we can learn from their stories. Uh, today we're going to be looking at. Uh, another pair of young people, like we've been looking at, we looked at uh, we looked at um, J- uh, not, not Jacob and Esau. <laughs> we looked last week, or we looked the first week at Cain and Abel. We were, we looked last week at another 
a couple of men in the Bible, and then today we're looking at two again. We're looking at Jacob and Esau today. And so younger people in the Bible are things that they did while they were younger. Of course, Jacob and Esau would be characters that would grow into their, uh, you know, grow great long lives and not be young people. But there's some things they did as young people that we can certainly learn from. And so we're going to dive into that a little bit today. But before we do that, we'll do a couple of sword drills to get everybody limbered up and ready to go for the services this morning. So we'll, uh, we'll start with that. We'll do two or three just to get us all awake and ready to go. Daniel 5.5. 5. Go. All right. Daniel 5.5. 5. Remember, you just got to say the first word. Good job. All right. Miss Monica got it. Miss uh, Mary Beth was distracted. She had her hymnal, so I was thinking the guys had a good shot that time. <laughs> but Miss Monica filled in for the ladies and, and got it. All right. Daniel 5.5. 5. All right. Next one will be, let's see, where do we want to go here? Well, that's a glossary. That's not going to be any good. Titus 3.1. Go. Titus 3.1. Oh, Miss Monica got it just before Brother Don. All right, that's two for the ladies. All right, we'll try and do one more. We'll give the guys a chance here. Some of you are using those pew Bibles, and uh, every now and then with youth ministry, we would have the pew Bibles, and of course the visitors would get those. And it was always easy if you did Genesis 1 or Revelation 22 because there was nothing at the ends of those Bibles or the beginnings of those Bibles. So if I wanted to control who got it, I would just do do those. But uh we got a variety of different Bibles in the hands today, so I can't cheat like that. We'll just do Leviticus 4.4. 4. Go. Leviticus 4.4. 4. Miss Monica's going for the hat trick. Oh, Miss Linda got it. All right. Good job, ladies. Leviticus 4.4. 4. Okay. Well, that, that got us going. I, hopefully, we're a little more awake than when we started. I'm ready to go. Fired up. I'm looking out there and seeing a lot of faces that don't look that awake, but that's okay. That's what the Sunday School Hour is for, right? We learn a little, we wake up a little, and we're ready for the morning service. Um, I always thought <clears throat> there were a lot of people that I know that Sunday evenings are favorite service, and I think the reason for that for me is it takes Sunday School and Sunday morning and then it's part of Sunday evening to just for me to get in the right frame of mind, uh, hearing the preaching, you know, it does something for you for Sunday school hour, it does something for you for Sunday morning. And then by the time you get to Sunday night, it's almost like you've been at a revival meeting, you've been at all these services already. And I think it just builds up on that. So I, I always enjoyed that. But the Sunday school hour being the first thing of the day, if you're not a morning person, sometimes, boy, that can be hard. And so I'll do my best this morning to try not to... Uh, put you to sleep here as we study these two men in the Bible, Jacob and Esau. If you don't know where they're at in the Bible, turn to Genesis 27. That's where we're going to be quite a bit for the Sunday school hour. Genesis 27. We'll back up to Genesis 25 in different places in the Word of God as we do this Sunday school lesson. But uh, Genesis 27 is where we're going to begin. One of the more famous passages concerning these two men We'll pray and then we'll start reading the Word of God. Lord, we thank you for this day and for your Word. Pray, please help us now to study it the best we are able. Lord, help us to follow the leading of your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to apply these things to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Genesis 27, if you, if you remember, Jacob and Esau, they are brothers. Jacob is foretold to be the one who would, who would lead, and even though he was not the elder, uh, we'll, we'll read those passages in a little bit, but uh, we come to Genesis 27, and in Genesis 27, we find the passage where Jacob is, is known, becomes known for being that trickster and that liar and that deceiver. And so we'll read through this passage, we'll see what we can learn from it, and then we're going to go backwards in history to see a couple of things from earlier on in their lives. So Genesis 27, and we'll start, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and start in verse number one. The Bible says, and it came to pass that when Isaac was old, and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see. He called Esau 
his eldest son and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old, I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out up to the field and take me some venison, and make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. So here's the clear, the clear, what's happening here is, is uh, he is sending out his son to get him a special meal and he's going to bless him uh, before he dies. That's his intention here is to bless Esau. Now verse number five, and Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. So Esau is obedient to his father. He's going out doing what he was told. Verse 6, And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord be, uh, before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock, and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is an hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father peradventure will feel me, and shall seem, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son, only obey my voice, and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory meat, such as his father loved. Now, <clears throat> This passage, of course, we see Rebecca, the mother, is coming into play here and not in a great way. She is uh, pulling a little trickery. And sometimes you see a child and you see the parents and you say, I know exactly where that child got that behavior from. Uh, sometimes, you know, husband and wife will say, if the kid gets in trouble, I'll, I'll look at Michelle and be like, that, that's your kid. And she'll look at me sometimes and say, that is your kid. And uh, sometimes, depending on what they do or what they say, we, we ascribe that trait to each other. And uh, here we see that uh, Jacob's deception and his, his conniving ways, uh, maybe that's from Rebecca. She's, uh, she's, got some, she's got some tricks up her sleeves. Now, she supersedes her husband's wishes here. Uh, she supersedes her husband's authority, and she recruits her son into a lie. She essentially endangers her son by doing so, but she did it for Jacob. Uh, and Rebecca... Though, though this is wrong, we ought to understand and remember that she knew that God had said that Esau would serve Isaac, um, or the, the, uh, Jacob. And so Genesis 25 tells us that. We'll go there in a little bit. Uh, that, and moms tend to help their children, you know, best they can to reach the potential that they believe they have. And God had already told her that the younger would serve the elder. And she loved and preferred Jacob. We know this from, again from Genesis 25. Um, when you love someone, you want what's best for them. Sometimes that gets taken a little too far and you don't, uh, you, you cast aside what is right uh, for what you think is best for somebody else. You try to help somebody else, even if it's not right the way in which you do it. And um, we know that she, of course, herself was the object of deception in Genesis 26 when, uh, 26, when her husband uh, deceived others and, and used her as an object of deception. So so, you know, yes, she's in the wrong here. And yes, you can maybe see uh, where Jacob gets it from as his mom is telling him to obey her and, and deceive her, his father. Uh, but uh, she's a human and she's had some things happen in her, lives, in her life that you can understand and see why this has come to pass. Now, if you look at Genesis 27, we, we already looked through verse 11 and 12. And one thing I think we can notice from uh, Jacob here that is very important for us to understand, not just on a personal level, but on a societal level, is that the only hesitation Jacob had, it wasn't, but mom, I don't want to disappoint my dad. It wasn't, but mom, this isn't right. It was, but mom, I might get caught. And if I get caught, I might suffer. That's the only, that's the only qualms that he had with this plan was, what if I get caught and, and then suffer for it? And so we can learn from this a couple of things about society as a whole. Uh, turn, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4 and Luke chapter 12. Hebrews 4 and Luke 12. Um, there's only one main thing that keeps people 
in line when it comes to society because not everybody in society has the Lord Jesus Christ in their life and in their heart. Not everybody in society has the conviction of the Holy Ghost guiding them throughout their day. And even those of us who do, we still struggle sometimes with obedience and living right. But being caught is one of those things that that deters crime, that deters people from doing wrong. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12, the Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and of spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not made not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So here we have a clear warning from God's word, not only about the word of God, and that the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart, but that the one that we have to do with, the Lord our God, sees all. And so when we consider getting caught, we typically uh, have this mindset of we don't want to get caught by others. We don't want to get caught by the cops. We don't want to get caught by our family members. We don't want to get caught, you know, doing the wrong by another person. And we completely forget that the Lord's already watching, waiting to see if we're going to do the right thing or not. Luke chapter 12 and verse number one, the Bible says, in the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Now, I don't know about you, but I know there's some times in my life where if everything that I ever whispered was put over a megaphone, it would probably not be a good thing. Uh, I know there's time in my life when if everything I ever did was, was put out for the world to see, would not be a very good thing, would not be something to be proud of. And that's, I believe, true for every person, unless you're just delusional and think that you never sin and never do anything wrong. And so uh, we, we understand that being caught is a great motivator not to commit the crime, not to do the wrong. Being punished would be the other motivator, I would believe. Turn with me to Esther 2, Proverbs 13 and Esther 2. Esther is, is one of those books of the Bible that so often you know exactly what's going to be preached when you go to Esther, when you're in the book of Esther, because it's essentially one story, but there's so much amazing material in the book of Esther uh, that you can draw from for your daily life, but Proverbs chapter 13 and Esther chapter number 2. All right, in Proverbs 13 and verse number 24, the Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Now, we've, we've talked about this before. We, we understand that uh, driving the fear of being punished into a child, that is what helps to keep them in the right way. Because if they grow up knowing that doing wrong means pain, then the cops don't have to teach them that later in life. And life doesn't have to teach them that the hard way. They can learn from a loving mother and father willing to use the rod, as the Bible says, so that they can learn obedience and learn not to disobey and do wrong. So uh, here we see that being caught, of course, is a, a great uh, motivator to do right. You don't want to be caught. And then also being punished. Some people don't care about being caught because they don't think they're going to be punished. Uh, think about our judicial system today, our legal system today, these people that you know, that get, get killed by police or whatever, and then you find out they have a rap sheet that's like 50 crimes long or 100 crimes long, and you think, how are they, how are they even on the street? How are they even out there? Uh, it's, it's crazy. And, and you, you wonder, who are, who are the people sitting in our prisons if there's people with 15 felonies and 10 misdemeanors walking the streets? It's pretty bad. And so you can see where there's some people out there that they don't fear being caught, because there's no punishment to go with being caught. It doesn't matter to them if they get caught because there's no punishment. So you have to have both. There's, you have to have punishment in order to fear being caught. And so Jacob, he's afraid that if he gets caught, he's going to get a curse instead of a blessing. And in Esther chapter 2 and a verse number, let's see, verse number 21, <clears throat> the Bible says, In those days while Mordecai sat, uh, sat in the king's gate, two 
of the king's chamberlain, Big Than and Teresh, of those which kept the door were wroth and sought uh, to lay hand on the king of Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther, the queen. And Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. So here, of course, in this story, we see Mordecai, and this would come into play later on in the book of Esther. Sorry, Esther, I keep saying Exodus because of our study in Exodus, and then it was like Ezra sticks in there, and my brain's going faster than my mouth can keep up today. But Esther, uh, we see Mordecai catches these men, and because they're caught, and because the matter is investigated and certified, the Bible says, their punishment, they get hanged in a tree, and uh, we're killed for their crime. And so the best deterrent to wickedness is punishment of wickedness. And we see that all throughout the scripture. We see the Bible teaching and proclaiming that we reap what we sow. And that if we sow to the flesh corruption, we're going to reap the same. If we sow to the spirit righteousness, we're going to reap the same. And so we need to understand this concept and we need to practice it in our lives. And Jacob is a wonderful example of this because his only fear in, in disobeying his father, in stealing from his brother, in doing this great wrong is what if I get caught? What if I suffer because of this? And that's just a reminder that those two things, capture and suffering, uh, are all that really stands between our flesh and doing whatever we want to do. Because if you're not saved, if, if you have people in this world that are not saved and you're trying to govern them without any punishment for evil doing, then, then people are just, you're going to have what we have today. You're going to have anarchy. You're going to have riots that are mostly peaceful and, and all this stuff with burning buildings in the background and, and you won't have any control over it because nobody fears you. Nobody fears authority. Nobody fears punishment. Nobody fears capture. And so the Lord knows what he's doing uh, in the way that he sets this thing up. Now, to get back to our story, you can turn back to Genesis 27 with me. Um, think about, while we're talking about Jacob and Esau at this younger age, they're both still unmarried. They're both still living at home. Uh, I don't know exactly how old they are in this story, but I would say they're young men because of, well, they're both at home and not married, and, and uh, you can study it out all you want. But uh, I, I think about with family, imagining the relationship that Rebecca had with Esau after this event. Because you think about it, Jacob gets run off. Jacob, Jacob has to flee for his life. His mom is at the center of this. His mom's the one that came to him with the plan. His mom's the one that will that will see put the sorry put the skins on him and did all. This. She coached him through the whole thing, and she's still there with Esau after Jacob runs off. And uh, so you, I can I can only imagine as a mother, you know, that relationship with your child because it's not like Esau was some other lady's kid, as so often was the case with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. All those people, there, there was often, you know, there, Hagar and, and all these other people and concubines and other wives and all these things. No, this was a, a child who was the twin to her, to the one she loved, Jacob, and yet she had gone and stabbed him in the back like this. And so uh, I can imagine that's a quite an interesting mother-son relationship there. People try to blame, you know, all their woes on their parents. Oh, my dad was bad. My mom was bad. Well, yeah. This was, Rebecca was pretty, pretty bad to her son Esau here. She tricked him and led to him losing, not only uh, losing his blessing after he had already lost his birthright. Now, in Genesis 27, verse number 19, we see Jacob is now getting into the action here. He's not going to let his mom do all the lying for him. He goes in and he's come to his father and, and uh, his father says in verse 18, who art thou my son? And Verse 19, And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. So here's, here's again, one lie leads to another lie, which leads to another lie. Because he, he started off with, Oh, I'm Esau. But then now... His dad's not taking just that answer. He's got more questions, and so that leads to more lies. So he says, oh, well, the Lord brought it to me. Uh, verse 21, And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. 
and he discerned him not because his hands were hairy, and he, he his brother Esau's hands, or as his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him, and he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and smelled the smell of his raiment, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore God give thee of the dew of the heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and thy mother's sons bow down to thee. <clears throat> Cursed be every one that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And so we know this story. We see what's what's happened here. And, and we see that this lie just leads to more lies and more lies. And my dad always would tell me, the less you lie, the less you have to remember. And that was, a, that was good advice because it's so true. Because you, you tell one lie and then you got to remember that lie so you can add on to that lie and so that your second lie doesn't mess up your first lie. You, it's, it's a fun age with young kids. You know, our, our kids are, are pretty good and, and we're trying to train them up in the way they should go. And, but every now and then, uh, very, very little, I think, for their age, but every now and then they'll say a lie. And sometimes I don't think they even understand quite what they're doing yet, some of the younger ones. But uh, when they do, you just have to keep asking them questions and eventually they're going to mess up and their lies aren't going to mesh. They're not going to work together because their minds can't quite remember what they said in the first part. And you can just quiz them until they give in and say, OK, yeah, I, yeah, I lied. <laughs> and, uh, and my dad used that trick on me. I remember when I was younger, you know, you tell a lie and he says, oh, what about this? And you just keep asking for more details and. And eventually you trip up and you, you mess up. Your lies don't match up and now you're, you're just cooked. And uh, so, so Jacob uh, teaches us a lot of what not to do when it comes to this story of, in the Word of God. Rebecca teaches us a lot of not, what not, come, uh, not to do in this story. And then in Genesis 27 and verse number 30, we see uh, <clears> the <throat> Bible says, And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and he was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father. He saw his brother came in from his hunting. And he also had made savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac his father said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? <laughs> That's not good. Trembled very exceedingly. Can you imagine? He's this man's being taken advantage of. His eyes are dim that he can't see. He's been fooled, and now the now he realizes what has happened, and and he's just it's like he's at a loss for words. Who? Where is he that has taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a loud, uh, with great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even also, O my father. And he said, thy brother came with subtility and hath taken away thy blessing. Now, all of a sudden here, this blessing being stolen by Jacob, which is what happened. He deceived and tricked and stole the blessing. Now, uh, the, what, what Esau had given away earlier in his life, what Esau had sold to Jacob, became a lot more precious than it, what, that it was to him before. Now, if you remember, Esau was the firstborn, and in, in Israelite culture, the firstborn, there was what's called the right of the firstborn. There are certain rights and portions and things that go to the firstborn that don't go to anybody else because they're the firstborn. It's the right of the firstborn, and that's an important thing. And Esau, if, if you'll go back with me to uh, Genesis chapter 25, Genesis chapter 25 and verse number, let's see, 23, I believe, is where we're going to start. Esau, all right, the birth of Esau and Jacob here in Genesis 25, 23. The Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. 
And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that, he came, uh, after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old uh, when she bare them. And the boys grew. Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And the boy and uh, Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Isn't that just a, I mean, that, that just fits even today. The, the guy loves the son that goes out hunting and make, gets meat, and the mom loves the boy who stays at home with her. It's just, it's like the mama's boy and the daddy's boy, the, the, the hunter and the and this homebody. And it's just, you can still see these personality types today in families um, all throughout our nation, all throughout the world because it's just it's just how it works sometimes but uh parental uh, parental favoritism doesn't always work out too well of course we see that with rebecca here but the sudden value of what esau had given away esau being born first as we just read would have inherited these certain values and rights uh but in genesis 27 or i'm sorry in uh in genesis 26 esau uh, gave away his birthright. He gave it away for a what? For a bowl of porridge, for a bowl, pot, bowl of pottage. It's just a, a bowl of soup, pretty much. He comes in from the field and he is hungry and he is uh, he has been out there a long time, we presume, and he's suffered apparently, and and he's just just dying for some food, and he wants and he wants the food, and Jacob craftily says, "Sell me." your birthright. And it is a sale. It's a transaction because Esau says, okay, this birthright is not doing me any good today. So I'm going to give it to you. And I'm going to take what I'm going, what is going to give me immediate satisfaction, uh, which is, uh, which is of course the bowl that he was looking for that bowl of food. Now, these young men <clears throat> would eventually reconcile later in life. We know this. We we studied through the book of Genesis together, and there's several chapters dedicated to these young men. Uh, but uh, and of course they wouldn't stay young men, but these men. And but when when they're young, we learn so many things from them that we learn that to control our flesh with Esau is so important because if we don't control our flesh, our flesh will control us, and it will cause us to make bad choices, like Esau made with selling his birthright for that for that porridge. Now. That, that food that he got, that was a temporary thing, and I'm sure it was great in the moment, but that moment was soon over, and he had more food the next day and the next day and the next day, and I'm sure he would not have died without that food. He, if he was there, then he was near to the tent, because the Bible says Jacob dwelt in the tent. He could have just gone to mom and said, hey, mom, can I have some food? My brother's trying to swindle me out of my birthright for the same thing I can get right here. It's like going to a McDonald's that wants 10 bucks for a dollar menu item when there's another one just down the block that wants a dollar. It doesn't make any sense. It's like you're that hungry that you can't wait five minutes. Or, you know, it's not like they have microwaves back then. Okay, so you're that hungry you can't wait an hour to get some food. You're going to go ahead and sell that birthright. That means The Bible actually says that he despised his birthright. That's how the Lord saw that transaction we got to be careful that we don't allow our flesh to make us crave something so much in the moment that we trade off blessings in the future for it. Uh, there was a Bible study one time at our Bible college. The, the dean of students uh, was, was, making the, was making a statement of, he, he was trying to tell the guys, he was trying to convince us uh, young men of uh, the idea, why would we give away, why would we trade in uh, the blessings of God in our life for momentary satisfaction. And of course, he, you know, he had different things in his message, but that, that was what was stuck with me was because the idea was, I'm going to get satisfaction for a moment, like the Bible says in Hebrews, pleasures of sin for a season, but I'm gonna, my trade-off is going to be so much more expensive than that. It's going to be cost so much more than that. Esau found out obeying your flesh in the moment can lead to great sorrow down the road especially once that birth, once that blessing was stolen, because now Esau's got nothing. When he sold his birthright, he thought, well, I still have a blessing coming my way, but then that gets stolen and now he has nothing. So we learn that 
from Esau, we learn that the flesh is, is a hard thing sometimes to conquer, but that it is always a bad thing to give into. Uh, this, um, uh, this Jacob uh, deceived and lied, and, and we learn from that. We learn the, the best way to combat wickedness in the lives of people is to make them understand that wickedness does bring pain. It does bring suffering. You will get caught and you will get punished. Now, you may not be able to convince somebody of that today in our day and age when it comes to the police or when it comes to whatever the judicial system, but you can make somebody understand or try to make them understand, as we saw, that God sees all things and God has that record book and you will one day answer to God for everything that you do. And so we can remind people of that and use Jacob as an example there, that Jacob's fear, his only fear, his, he was not worried about disappointing his father. He was not worried about his brother killing him, which is why he would have to flee afterwards. He didn't think about any of that. He thought about, what if I get caught and inherit a curse instead of a blessing? And so we got to keep that in mind and remind ourselves that every wicked deed we do, every evil action we take, there is a consequence to that. It may not happen today. It may not happen tomorrow, but it's coming at some point. We reap what we sow. So we learn that from, from Jacob. Of course, we can learn from Rebecca and we can learn from Isaac. There's lessons for parents there, of course. Uh, the preferential treatment that Rebecca showed and, and the, the sinful actions that Isaac had taken earlier on in Rebecca's life that may have attributed to her decisions there. So there's lots to learn from the parents as well. Um, but then Jacob uh, and Esau, uh, those brothers, would be separated for many, many, many years because of this act of Jacob, uh, and, and it wouldn't have been, I don't think it would have been such a blow had Esau not already given away his birthright. Now Esau forgets the, the manner of the transaction. If you were to read further in Genesis 27, when he's talking to his father and he's whining about what's happened, he he's makes mention that, uh, that his brother stole his birthright, and, and that's not true. He sold his birthright to his brother. And that's another lesson for us to remember that sometimes we'll do something and we regret it and then we change the narrative. And we say, well, this is what happened. And it's like, no, that's not what happened. That's what you wish happened because you did the wrong thing. You made the wrong choice. There was a time, I, I don't think I'll ever forget it because I'm just still embarrassed by it, but my wife and I, we were newly married and, and you know, learning how to manage finances and all that stuff. Of course, we got married and we were... We were paying $750 a month in rent, and I made, I think, 12000 that year. And so you all doing the math know that we were uh, living on love and not money, <laughs> and we were living on student loans and, and all that. And so it, we were learning about all this stuff, and we, you know, we're young people, and we got married young. And, and I remember at one point, we had gone, and I think it was like a gym membership. And we had gone and you had to pay a certain amount of money up front. And, and we thought that you could cancel within so much time. And, and we didn't read the fine print because how many people actually read the fine print of all those documents. And we put, I think it was like $500 down. It was supposed to be for, for the whole year or for two years. And, and then when we realized that our schedules and our location didn't allow us to actually use it, we tried to cancel it and get some of the money back. And guess what? It would, didn't work that way. And so we learned the hard way that, yeah, I, I made a mistake, but they don't care that I made a mistake. They've got my money and they aren't giving it back. And with, with Esau, he made a mistake and it doesn't matter that he now regrets that mistake. His, his birthright has been sold. It's gone now. And so we have to remember and keep in our mind that uh, the mistakes we make, the things that we do, uh, they can have such a lasting effect. Now, it's hard to remember that in the moment. In the moment, it's all about, you know, whether it's an anger thing, whether it's a lust thing, or whether it's a greed thing. In the moment, that's what the focus is on. But if we, if we just give ourselves a little bit of patience from the Lord, if we just let the Holy Spirit hit the brakes on us a little bit and say, step back, look at the situation, what is this going to cost? If I commit this sin, if I do this wicked deed, what is it going to cost me down the road? Now, the proper attitude would be, I don't want to do that thing because I don't want to hurt my Savior. I don't want to do that thing because I love the Lord. But, but if, if, if that doesn't work, then at least maybe we can appeal to our own self-preservation desires and say, wait, if I do this thing, 
not only am I going to hurt my Lord, not only am I going to strain my relationship with my God, but I'm also going to reap what I've sown and something's going to, to happen to me as a result of this. Now, that idea, you know, some people take that to an extreme. They say, oh, you don't pay your tithes. God's going to break your legs and stuff like that. It's just ridiculous teachings. That's not how the Lord works. But the concept of reaping what we sow is true regardless. You may not ever in this life reap what you have sown in this life, but there is a judgment day coming and there's an accounting day coming and we're all going to stand before God and give answer for the things that we do. As there's songs sung about, you know, looking at others that are living wickedly and and seems like their life's just great. Nothing's going wrong for them. And we wonder why we're doing, we're do, trying to do so good and everything's going wrong. And, and so people can get confused about reaping and sowing. But uh, the truth of the matter is, like we saw earlier, that everything is naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That the word of God and that God himself sees all and that the best thing we can do is to slow down and say, all right, I'm not going to be Jacob. I'm not going to deceive. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to trick and steal. I'm going to do what is right even if it's my own mother telling me to do what is wrong, even if it's my own father or, or a close friend, even if it's somebody that I care deeply about, if they're telling me to do wrong, I'm going to stand my ground and say, no, I'm not going to be like Jacob. So let's, let's take some of these lessons home with us. I'm sure there's many more to be learned from Jacob and Esau at that stage of their lives. And we looked at some of them as we studied through Genesis. I'd encourage you to uh, study them out a little bit. There's, there's so much to know, so much to learn. Woohoo! All right, that's time to pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you've blessed us with, Lord. Help us to understand, Lord, as we see people like Jacob and Esau in your word and all that we can learn from them and for the dynamic of their relationship from, Lord, from everything from this deception, Lord, to even when they are reunited later in life. Lord, I pray you please help us to learn these lessons in a way that honors and glorifies you. Lord, we love you and Jesus, and we pray. Amen. Thank you, Artist Smith.